I see how Patty is. She ignores all my talk. No, I was listening. I was listening. <laughs> sure. Do you believe you Eliza? How your how your one of your students almost drowned at Alice in Butte. Maria Dosso. Maria Dosso. Oh, I thought Alice in Butte. You said Alice in Butte. Did he? Huh? Yeah. What happened, Alice in Butte? Yeah. No, it was up in Redosa. Oh, uh, what lake was that? I don't know. I know there's that big one over uh, in the Mount Gods. Yeah, I know about that one. It's interesting. I thought it was a little bit too loud. That's why I put my AirPod on so I could hear him and talk to him. So you guys are hearing all that static and all that background noise. I could though if you wanted to. All right. So environmental emergencies. I am recording, so I will put it up on YouTube as soon as I figure out the new damn Edge um, web browser. I downloaded it and then it put it down there. It wouldn't let me save it as. Oh, shut up, Siri. Siri tends to be a pain in my butt. Your desktop is logical. All right. So, we're talking about the environment. Temperature. Hot, cold, right? And do we have really that happy medium here in El Paso? It's either too hot or too cold, right? And when it's just right, it only lasts for what, a couple hours? Like yesterday, it was beautiful for a while, but it was horrible at times. As EMTs, we should expect to go on those, on those calls. Right now in the summer, uh, when I was working at Sierra Blanca, that's one thing I would get frequently. Would be what was it? That's what I was going to get to uh, with the environmental, uh, but specifically the international travelers are crossing down there in, in Hudson County, where they have all that desert terrain, and so suffer from dehydration, suffer from heat exhaustion. One thing I want you guys to remember when it comes to environmental emergencies, whether it's heat or cold, the extremes in age are very, very susceptible to environmental emergencies. The very young, because they can't regulate their temperature very well, and they have more surface area. And the very old, they can't because they've lost body fat. They've lost thickness in, in their skin. So they don't stay as warm as they should. That's why they're always they're always cold because they're not staying warm. In the summer, you turn on the AC for them, and they're like, "I'm cold," and you're dripping sweat, and you know they're looking at you with a straight face and say, "I'm cold." So what do you do? Suffer or make them suffer? What do you think? Suffer or make them suffer? Suffer. Okay. Patty says, "Make them suffer." <laughs> oh, is that Liza? <laughs> it was me. It was Liza. Uh, How did they make this the first one? I would suck her. I'd rather blame it on Patty. She seems more like that. I'm always cold, too, so I'll be cold with them. One of the things... One of the things... Um, uh, 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 shoot. No, no, I'm trying to remember the story. I, I, my memory is getting worse. Anyway, I'll come back to it. So, um, with, with geriatrics, you have to be on the lookout for, uh, for heat and cold emergencies. And later on, we talk about elder abuse that's happening as well. 
Okay, so environmental emergencies, heat. How do we, as humans, lose heat? There's several, several methods of heat loss. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you, Patty. I'm not on camera anymore. Patty was saying how she sleeps. Most women are not, but there, there's another reason too. Hey, Patty, screaming, you can hear me. No, I'm scared. So I'll come back to the, the cold. So, what are the methods of heat loss? So radiation. What does the radiation mean? It's just a, a capture from the area. Okay, give me an example. So, oh, there's Patty. Hey, Patty. Yes. Have you had your thyroid checked? No, because I'm not overweight. Huh? I thought you only got your thyroid checked when you're having, when if you have issues with like being overweight or if you feel like you can't lose weight. Well, your thyroid helps control your metabolism. So if you have a hyperactive thyroid, you're going to be skinny and you're going to always be hot. If you have an underactive thyroid, you're right, the, the, you'll, you'll gain weight, but you're always, always cold. Oh, no, I haven't. So, anyway. Huh? I said, now that I know that, I should get it checked. There you go. So, anyway. So, example of radiation. If you get close enough to the wall, and right now you're radiating heat. If you put your hand to your cheek, you might feel a little bit. Because it's coming off of you, just like the sun is, is radiating heat. Or even your car, when you're standing next to it, you stand, you know, you're cold and you stand next to it and you warm up next to the, the warm engine. That's radiant heat. It's putting out heat. So by us just sitting here, we're losing heat. Where do we lose the most heat from? Okay, because normal, but more specifically the head. So yeah, hands and feet also, but more specifically the head. So that's why back in the old days, like Little House on the Prairie stuff, they wore those nightcaps because they didn't have central heat. They had a fireplace. So we had to worry about carbon monoxide a little bit. But anyway, so they put on those nightcaps to keep that heat in so they would stay warm. Because we lose the majority of our heat through the head. All right, so we have radiation. What else, Mr. Darren? Uh, respiration. Through respiration. Yep. As we breathe, remember that air is coming from inside the body, so that's warm. You know when you wear glasses and you have your mask on and then all of a sudden your glasses fog up? It's because we have heat. The heat that you're breathing out. Or even just when it's a cold winter day, you get that nice and you can see your breath. Same thing, that's because your lungs actually warmed up that air. And that's how you burn calories. Mm -hmm. You also burn calories by kissing, by the way. You burn calories just by living, so. I was trying to make it fun. <laughs> I remember that. Well, there's a lot of ways to burn so calories, honey, but we won't go there, so. Lou. Up. <laughs> just, just start writing it down, see how many calories we can burn <laughs> doing what. More pop-ups? I need my mouse. All right. So, radiation, respiration. What else, Miss Robin? Infection. 
Convection? All right, tell me about convection. In your own words. Isn't that radiation? How do you lose that heat via convection? Kind of think about it. We have convection ovens, right? So kind of think about that process. Does that help at all? Maybe? Yeah, no? You look a little flush again. Huh? Wind chill? Yeah, you're kind of you're kind of heating up the air around you, but it's not through through radiation. It's a circulation of, of warm air around you. Oh, I thought we were doing convection. Yeah, well, like she said, convection oven. How do ovens cook food? What? It, it does provide heat, yes, but how, how is that heat working for your food? It cooks it from the inside out. So it cooks it from the inside out. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're warming it up. We're warming up the temperature around it, but we're also warming up that inside of that food. So what's, what happens when you're slowly increasing that heat? So as the air circulates within the stove, that air gets hot. And so it's bringing down the, uh, the heat onto that food and it's cooking it from the inside out. So it's basically that hot air that's circulating. So there has to be a source to release that heat. Have you ever noticed, number one, when maybe the air conditioning is not working, you have a lot of bodies in a room and all of a sudden it gets stuffy in there? That's because of all the heat with everybody, it goes up and it warms up the room. Right? Okay. Like you want to snuggle with your girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, dog, whoever you have at home for you, right? You snuggle them, you feel that warmth on you, right? Cold winter day, you're like, oh yeah, nice and warm. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep each other warm. But when it's too hot, then you're like, oh my God, get away from me. Right, it's too hot because now your body, your bodies are just producing that heat off of each other. Even if you're not physically touching each other, right, you could still feel that warmth off of somebody. Just like you could go outside and say, like the pavement, right? It's so much harder. It's absorbed that heat from the sun. So there's difference between objects and let's say just what's in the ambient air. All right, so we have radiation. We have respiration. We have conduction or convection and. Evaporation. OK, evaporation. And what is evaporation? It's sweating. Mm -hmm. So as our body tries to release that, it sweats up and that cool air or that air comes and it dries you off. So it cools you down that way. And this process is going to be very important later on when you're learning the difference between heat stroke and now, now, now I lost your heat exhaustion and heat stroke. There's a difference between the two and that sweating is going to be a very important factor in that. And there's one more. Conduction. So tell me about conduction. It's just any lost in direct contact, so like wet clothes behind you, uh, ice packs. That's like evaporation. No, it's it's coming from your body. No, but like like you know, jump in a pool. No, it's the source. Have you ever taken over somebody's seat and it's like, oh, thank you for keeping my seat warm? 
fast conduction. If I put a flame to this here, or by me grabbing it, is that am I not transferring heat to this to this leg? So again, like you said, it's coming conduction. from an outside source, but not necessarily like say wet clothes stuff like that. It's you transferring heat from one object to another. All right, so heat loss. Remember when we talked about pathophysiology and how the body's going to do what it can to take care of itself. And so we lose heat to stay cool. Homeostasis says, I want my temperature to be 98.6, give or take a few degrees. I don't want it to get too hot because I'm going to be uncomfortable. I don't want it too cold because I won't be able to do it. So the body's going to try and regulate that temperature. What's the, the, what's the temperature control of the body? It's in the brain. What do you guys think over there on computer world? The temperature control sounds like? Uh -huh. The hypothalamus. The hypothalamus. Hypothalamus controls the body's temperature. All right, so now we know as our body heats up, it's going to want to take care of itself. So we start to sweat, right? What is in that sweat? Water. Okay, there's water waste, but Patty said water. But what else is in there? Salts or electrolytes. Sodium. So why is the sodium or salt necessary in the body? This goes back to your pathophysiologies. Which cells? And do you know what? We know that the cell is here, right? The sodium potassium pump um, cycles sodium potassium, right? To pass along the electrical impulses to the next cell. So it's a slingshot effect. So that's why we need sodium? That's one of the reasons we need sodium. The other reason. Our muscles to be able to contract require sodium, right? So if we lose sodium, what's going to happen? Start cramping up. So when you've been working out in a, on a hot day and you have a dark shirt and then you notice those white rings on, what is that white ring? It's salt. That's how salt salt uh, producers, the countries and the locations, get the salt. They have seawater into an area, and then the water evaporates, and it leaves behind salt. And they go in their heart, that salt. I know because my hometown of Mexico is the largest salt producer exporter in the world. So, yes, but anyway, uh, so that's salt. And so you'd be getting developing heat cramps. Where'd you guys go? Can you close that out? Yeah. You can't shut off soon. I don't know how to. Oh, this? Yeah. Right click. Your dang MacBook. No. I still see you, Lou. Okay. Why are you in a good mood over there? It's just really cold in my house. <laughs> you guys look pretty dead right now. You guys don't look excited. You got coffee. I don't know why you're saying. Mm -mm. <laughs> Clarissa, say hi. 
Hi, come say hi to me. <laughs> Patty says, go say hi to her. Don't, don't, don't. Hey, look. Hi, Andres. You guys wake up, man. Eating, that's good. At least you're doing something. Give it Patty wants somebody to chug. I don't know what. To chug? I want somebody to bring me a shot. She's trying to talk. Lou has them on you. No, I have them in my ear. Oh, in your ear. <laughs> I'm not that fancy. I am. So right, we got heat cramps. Who here's had heat cramps? All right, yeah, no, okay. You guys don't go out in the sun and exercise, none of that, no. We try to avoid it, right? I try to avoid it. Hopefully little ginger. I don't like the sun, the sun don't like it. Hi guys. So, so we got heat cramps, right? We lost too much sodium, we sweated out our electrolytes, we lost some potassium. How do we remedy that? Yeah, Gary, yeah, let's have some electrolytes. Uh, there's some stuff out there that I, I really like. Body Armor, it has more electrolytes, it has more potassium in it. But yeah, some sort of sports drink, right? Especially for you guys, right? You can't start IVs, do any of that fun stuff, stick people. So, does pickle juice really help? Do what? Pickle juice. Pickle juice? Yeah, well, I think that helps. Not, I mean, it's it's really high in sodium, but I, I wouldn't do that for anybody that I'm treating. I wouldn't chug that. I'm not a for, like actual treatment. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, some people do, but just drink something, eat some stuff, you know. What else is high in electrolytes? Anybody? And it's in the name. Pedialyte. Yeah. Watch out. I don't know what Lou's talking about, but yeah, Pedialyte <laughs> does have electrolytes in it, right? We give it to our kids. They start puking. They have diarrhea any of that stuff, we start giving them Pedialyte to start replacing that stuff that we're losing. Um, what else? How hot and humid is it in Florida in the summer? The humidity alone will get you in these coastal regions, Louisiana too, New Orleans. Oh, oh my God, it is humid. And even though it may not reach the temperatures like 100 degrees or higher, like it does here, and I come from Phoenix, we did 120. And I still think it's hot when it's 70 degrees. But <laughs> you get into high humidity area or places that have high humidity, what's happening with your body? Sort of think about it. Really think about it. There's now more humidity outside. So what are you going to do? What happens when you feel humidity? Has anybody ever gone to these places? Somewhere that has a lot of humidity? What happens as soon as you start going outside? You just start sweating. You feel sticky, right? Yeah. You, just, you step right up. You step out of the shower and... Right, so what other types of food? Not even drinks. I mean, they have some come and maybe. What about bananas? Right? Sodium slash bananas. Bananas. Yeah. 
bananas have a ton of potassium. So they'll give them to athletes too. Oh, you start having heat cramps. All right, like let's start eating bananas. Let's start hydrating you again. Right? So what else? Did you talk about the problem with Gatorade and Powerade? The problem with Gatorade and Powerade is that they have tons of sugar in them. So, right, our bodies need sugar. But the way that they artificially sweeten it and the sugar content, there's certain shifts that happen in the body and it's just too much. It's too much at once. We want to start, we want to do it gradually, especially if we're having these heat emergencies, right? So you may encounter somebody, right? Our patients get overheated. We might get red. I especially get red, right? I'm super pale. Again, pale ginger freckly. I turn colors. I get red, maybe pouring sweat. I'll be pale, maybe a little, a, a little pale and flush. So right, I've got redness in the face, I'm pale, I'm sweaty. I just don't feel good. I'm gonna start feeling nauseous too. Because, right, we need the sodium and potassium for muscle contractions. When that starts happening, what is our stomach? Acid? Something about acid? No, but it does have acid. It is a muscle. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good try, though. Uh, so, our stomach is a giant muscle, right? So we can start having contractions. It will make us start to feel nauseous, feel a little crazy. If somebody is having an emergency and they feel nauseous, are you going to make them slam water? Yeah. My school water hits your stomach. Have you ever had that happen? It, it feels like, ooh, right? Because now the temperature is and your stomach may contract more than that. And then yes. right. So when I said other have I be a supplies available, we little sips. People would want to chug, right? Because they're like, I'm thirsty. No, take little sips at a little time because otherwise you experience that nausea, it hits you a little bit too hard, you start throwing up, and then boom, you've got a bigger mess, two bigger messes. One with the body, and two, now you got to deal with puke. And you don't want to deal with puke because you don't want to see what somebody else eats, especially if they have like lasagna or something. Oh, it's, it's just bad. So we want to avoid that, right? So what are some sort of treatment options that you think that you could start doing for your patients if you encounter, let's just say, um, heat exhaustion? Right, so you guys have gone over that. So what is heat exhaustion first? Anybody? Out of nowhere. Anybody want to go for it? You've got your books in front of you. Go ahead, look up the definition. Is it dehydration? Well, they will experience some dehydration, right? Because they have been sweating, it's hot, they've lost fluid. So dehydration is actually, uh, it's, it's a problem as well as a symptom of heat exhaustion. So, but go ahead. There's gonna be definitions of heat exhaustion and heat stroke in your book. Go ahead and look those up real quick. Whoever gets to it first, just blurt it out. Watch what I wish for. <laughs> we stream physical exertion in a hot, humid environment. And then I can just get, uh, it serves the body's blood flow, resulting in a mild state of shock. Okay. Does it give a list of symptoms there for you? 
said patient skin is normal to poor temperature, they pale or ash ashy tree in color and sweaty. Mm -hmm. and Go, go ahead. Tell me what page that's on. That way, everybody else could go to it. Seven forty-seven, guys. All right. So our patients are pale. So remember, we went over shock, right? So those symptoms are looking a lot similar, right? We're starting to recognize that. There's a lot of symptoms that overlap each other. So it's going to be our job to recognize what's causing that shock. So we can determine, right, it's um, 92 degrees outside, I think, maybe. Uh, that's just what my watch told me. So it's 92 degrees outside, right? It's hot. It's hot for me, at least. So somebody absolutely can experience heat exhaustion outside right now. They're exerting themselves. They're losing fluids. So they get pale, will be sweaty, right? So what do you think is the first thing that we're going to want to do? Pull them down. How about we get them out of that hot environment? Move them into a shady area, right? Remove them from the source of the problem. Okay, because let's 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 not add things on top of let's not just keep on allowing things to happen. We're going to try to stop them as much as possible. We can't stop everything, but this particular one with heat emergencies or at least environmental period, we can try to accommodate the situation. So right, we're going to remove them out of the situation. Okay, then what? Then we want to try to bring down their body temperature. Now, this is a double edged sword. We don't want to bring down a patient's body temperature too rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can cause we our bodies just acclimated to that, not necessarily acclimated, but we got used to that temperature. You drop that temperature even more, you could kind of shock the body, just depending, right? Not everybody's body is the same. And it's not always going to react the same. Here, let me move you guys just a little bit because I can't see this guy's head. I'm just seeing the top of your head, so I want to see everybody. <laughs> Um, I don't see Patty now. And there's somebody else. I'm still here. It's because my son keeps jumping in because he's having trouble with his schoolwork. But I'm still here. All right. That's another issue. The Jay? Who's Jay? That's Jasmine. Oh, okay. That's Jasmine. Oh, is it doing everything that we're saying? Yeah, oh man, hey, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, anyways, now that I'm over my technology thing, uh, let's go back to this. So, we've removed them from the environment. Get them out of the sun. Get them into a shaded area at least. If you're going to be in an ambulance, get them into the back of an ambulance. Well, whether your ambulance has AC or not, that's going to be completely dependent on where you're working. I've been in ambulances that don't have AC, which just sucks, but it is what it is. Adapt and overcome, guys. This is a lot of our job. Adapt and overcome. Sometimes you have equipment that doesn't work, and guess what? You're going to make it work. So we've removed them from the environment. We don't want to do rapid cooling. You don't dump water on top of them. You don't soak them. You don't immerse them in anything. You're going to cool them down too much. Just do it gradually, step by step. Passive cooling. They used to say, oh, yeah, pour water on them, do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. No, not for heat exhaustion, right? Now we're going to have them drink some water. Usually if they're dehydrated and their blood pressure is super low, then you have somebody like me that comes in and is going to do an IV. But however, 
right? You're going to have to the patient's symptoms, right? So we want to know about our patients. Vital, good. So blood pressure, right? What's well, something super we can get? Well, you could do it, but what about heart? You could check a heart rate. So we can determine what um, after cardiac. Fast, okay. 100. You may be thinking about 120. You want to go, right? Okay. So, heart rate. Yeah, so your patients now tachycardic and their blood pressure is normal. That means so, but something is start pulling them, maybe hydrate them, get them going. Now, what if your blood pressure is low? What do we want to do? Anybody? Maybe uh, people? What? Oh, that's a question. So we've removed our patient from their environment, from the heat. So we've now discovered that they're experiencing symptoms of shock, one of them including a low blood pressure now. So what do we want to do? Raise their legs. Right. We can raise their legs. What is that going to do? It's going to send blood to the heart. So yeah, so we're going right. to start we're moving. Experiment. Right, so now we're having, we elevate and we can start preserving. So we want to protect what's in here, right? The brain and the organs. We can live without arms and legs. It would suck, but we can live without them. So, but we want to preserve as much blood flow to the organs as possible because in heat injuries, especially the kidneys can be damaged, which is a very big deal. You need your kidneys. So, right, what else? Anybody? Now, am I blowing your guys' minds? Or are you just trying to think? I see the smoke coming out of your ears trying to think about it. Everybody. Hello. I didn't want to interrupt anybody, but uh, somebody lost the bill here. Dollar bill. Anybody wants to claim it? I'll claim it. What is it? Uh, <laughs> what, no, what was it that you lost? Did you drop any cash, Mr. Commission? When you came in? No. Double check. Are you sure? Oh, you don't have any cash? Anybody? No? All of you are honest. It's a big number here. It would have been one. I'll just give it to anybody, but it's not. Okay, well, thank you. See you, Mr. Luna. We'll get together when we so we can try to talk. Okay, yeah. So, um, let's see, heat exhaustion. Well, is there anything you want to add into that? Your body is still cooling itself down. The cooling mechanism is still, still functioning. Oh, yes. So we're still able to sweat at this point. So your patients are going to be pouring sweat. Their body's still trying. Again, we're going to be looking at this compensated versus decompensated. You can sort of look into those things. So when our body is compensated, we're still able to sweat. We're still trying. Our body temperatures are probably going to be normal, maybe just slightly elevated, but we are experiencing those symptoms of heat exhaustion. Now, what about heat stroke, guys? And this is a big difference, and this is what I mentioned earlier about sweating. 
The body won't sweat. The body won't sweat. Why is this a problem? Because we're not able to cool ourselves down. Yeah, so now our bodies aren't able to cool ourselves down. So the temperature rises. I have seen people where they have their core body temperature was 105. That is a big deal. So when we're, so even when we have fevers and we start getting that high, we're looking at organ damage. And again, this is why I mentioned the kidneys. Our kidneys are super fickle. They don't like to be messed with. They want to be happy and they want everything to be perfect. But now that our bodies are heating up, our kidneys are probably the organs that are furthest away in blood flow as far as organs are concerned, of what we need at least, right? So they're sitting right back here on our flank, right? And they're what helps filter, they're a filter organ, right? Well, they also help us maintain our electrolytes. And they're also producing other hormones, and we, we don't have to get into too much in detail on that, but they're helping us um, maintain the homeostasis. So once those get damaged, you have a lot of toxins start building up in the system that we don't want. And that will just damage the kidneys further. And then once your kidneys are shot, ooh boy, that is not a fun day. Okay, so now our patients aren't sweating. They're gonna feel hot to the touch. They're gonna be dry have dry skin, right? Our sweating mechanism has failed. Our body temperature is rising. You now may see confusion, right? Our, our body, our brain is not meant to function at temperatures that high. So, right, they may be confused. They may tell, be telling you a bunch of nonsense or garbled or completely unconscious. Totally depends. So now our brains aren't functioning because our body temperature is too high. Again, now what are we going to do for these patients? Think back to heat exhaustion. What was the first one that we said? No, not vitals. Get them out of the environment. Okay. Then we can worry about vitals. <laughs> Right, so anytime that you have a patient that may be in danger or the environment's not safe, get them out of that environment. First step. Cool. All right. So we get them out of the environment. What next? Now they've got dry skin. Now they might be talking a bunch of nonsense. They're hot to the touch. Their temperature, you, you feel they're burning you as soon as you touch them. What now? Yeah, you can get some vitals. So now let's say they've got a heart rate of 130 and their blood pressure is 80 over 40. They're hot to the touch. Their skin is going to look flush. And, uh, and now they're not. What do you guys think? Put them in a shock position. position. Okay. Now what else? Okay, but what if they put something else that you can do? Could we cool them down with a cooling blanket? They, they have cooling blankets in the hospital, but I almost guarantee that most EMS services will not have cooling blankets. However, what else do we carry? You cool it down with like the saline solution or cool wet towels. Cool wet towels and some saline solution instead. Cool packs. What I said, I said cool packs. I said ice packs. Two, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll give that to you. All right, so where do we place them? 
Do you guys know? Under their arms, by their armpits, behind their knees, and behind their neck. And the groin area. So why, why are these spots important? Can you tell me? Yeah, you know, you answered. Um, they're, they're the parts that cool faster. <laughs> nice try. Um, however, we get a lot of blood flow to these areas, right? We've got kind of a lot of vasculature there. So we've got some main arteries that will actually run behind the knees. There's also places in the groin right here, right? So you've got femoral arteries. You can also check pulses here. I've seen people do that all the time, but it's just super hard to find. So I don't even bother. So, but you place it right here in the armpits by the neck. Don't do this. It's right back here. All right. So this will help us cool us down a little bit faster because right now, boom, our temperature is through the roof more than it should be, right? So we want to do this, but we don't want to cool them too fast. You're going to be monitoring your patient's temperature very regularly, okay? Because you want to see and you're going to, of course, we have them in the shock position. So now we're trying to bring blood flow back into the body or at least the core of the body. What else? There's a part in your skill sheet somewhere in there. It's kind of at the top, right? You go BSI scene safe and then what else? What can you ask for? Let me put it that way. Yes. Well, yeah, you could you could ask you could do the whole sample OPQRST, all of that stuff. But I'm saying, I mean, like chief complaint. No, not chief complaint. I'm saying, uh, what resources? You can request ALS. There we go. Request additional resources. Someone of a higher power than you or you haul them into the hospital and make them somebody else's problem. That is our main job in EMS is to absolutely make it somebody else's problem, 100%. I do that all the time. I'm like, all right, here's my shit show patient, take them. It's yours now. I don't want them. <laughs> you deal with it. That is our main job, right? Rapid transport. Once you identify a patient that is in a shock light condition, you want to say rapid transport. This is very important when you come to your national registry um, EMT skills testing, requesting additional resources and rapid transport, identifying the problem right away and making sure saying, all right, am I going to be able to do interventions on scene or am I going to want to load and go and do interventions in my truck, right? It's a little hard to think of it that way for you guys because we're in a classroom setting, so you're just verbalizing everything. But once you get out into the field, please, by any means, if somebody looks bad and you go, oh shit, and you get that feeling, load them up and go. Because you don't want to deal with them forever, right? Get them to a hospital, get them to a doctor. Because, and especially in these heat emergencies, we can have something called rhabdomyolysis. We often very much shorten it to rhabdo. And what that is, is that the muscles are breaking down. And once they produce this, um, it's myoglobin is what's being released. And it's a breakdown of muscle tissue. The kidneys can't process that. So once we start producing that, that patient actually will have a, an acute kidney injury is what we call it, um, but it will be a very acute renal failure is what it can cause. It doesn't mean that it's going to be lasting, but it does mean that it, it will absolutely happen, that they are gonna have problems with their kidneys. And the way that you identify the syndrome, very classic finding is when they pee, 
it's going to look like this. Right, for you guys, it's Dr. Pepper or Coca-Cola colored urine. It's going to be brown. That's myoglobin. That's the breakdown of it. That's how you find it. I, I worked at UMC and we had a motorcycle crash victim and it happens in traumas too, right? Just damage to the muscle tissue. And all of a sudden I notice, oh, that's not good. Go to the doctor. Hey, I think your patient's in rhabdo, by the way. What? Oh no, now we need to do a bunch of other stuff. All right, these are things that you need to consider. It's not something that you're gonna be able to fix. I promise you that, but identify it. And the more patient, uh, patient information that you're able to obtain and then be able to relate to a hospital staff member, either uh, another nursing staff or either the doctor, if they're there when you're giving report, the better they're able to treat that patient. And that's our entire goal is to make sure that these patients get the care that they need. That way they can live the longest life possible. Because, right, sometimes we're just preventing Darwinism. Does everybody know what Darwinism is? It's a theory of evolution. And basically, when we say the Darwin Award, it means that you did something stupid that almost took you out. You almost killed yourself. So we're preventing that from happening. That's why people are living longer nowadays. Right, because medicine is advancing. And even EMS is advancing, right? Because back in the day, not even, I think it was probably 60 years ago, EMS was just a bunch of people driving hearses, picking up bodies or picking up people that were nearly dead and then just dropping them off the, at the hospital and not doing anything patient care wise. So it's involved greatly. And you guys should be very appreciative that you're getting to learn this type of medicine nowadays. So, what else? Anything else? Do you guys have any questions on that? <laughs> I see wheels turning, maybe. Did you guys understand that? Is there a better way that I can explain it to you? No, anybody out there in uh, online land? No, we good? All right, so let's move on to something that we, we may not encounter as much here, considering we are a desert environment, but you still will see it. Um, cold emergencies. So we're losing body heat. What can happen? Tell me. It can be hypothermic, which is? Right, so, so your body temperature is lower than what it should be, right? There's different degrees of hypothermia. We'll, we'll go over that here in a little bit, but let's be a little bit more broad and then I'll break it down for you guys, okay? Before I, I I'll just, I'll end up throwing too much information at you all at once. I don't wanna, explode your brains okay um so we can be hypothermic what else what other type of cold emergencies you'll hear about it what about the people that climb mount everest frostbite there we go okay so there could be frostbite now what else So yes, they can die. So you get too cold and your body functions just cease, right? You're basically a popsicle at this point, a human popsicle, if you will. So there is a rule in EMS that you are not dead until you're warm and dead. Okay, has anybody heard that? Not yet, maybe, no? Okay. I you dead until you are warm and dead. We will work you for as long as possible until we get your body temperature up into a normal range. From there, we start doing a little bit more stuff. 
but we're going to keep working you for the amount of time that usually H A creates. And then we'll call it, but you're not dead until you're warm and dead. Do we know why? Has anybody heard of people coming back from being frozen to death and then being alive afterwards? Yeah, because it puts the organs into like sleep, doesn't it, or something like that? Yes, so what happens is when we get too cold, our metabolism will actually slow down. And our cellular metabolism will actually slow down as well. So once we slow down that process, everything just kind of goes at a standstill. Think of it as the clock stopping and we're stopping time. Right, everybody watched those Doctor Strange movies and then all of a sudden time got all weird. No, okay, well fine. I guess I'm the only Marvel fan in this room. <laughs> Girl, I thought you. <laughs> okay, cool, we're good then. Uh, so yeah, so let's just think as time standing still, right? Nothing's working, none of our cells are going, they're not metabolizing anything. There's also no toxins building up during that time because nothing is metabolizing. So we've got time. We've got time with these people. We just want to treat them very carefully. If they're dead and frozen, you want to transport them gently. Because you start jostling them around, you're, you're going to knock some stuff around, right? So we're thinking about muscle injuries. You knock around somebody that's frozen with the muscles, that's going to stimulate the body to start releasing things. We don't want that. Treat them very gently. Package them very gently. Warm them. We don't want to warm them up too fast, just like we don't want to cool anybody too fast. We do not want to warm anybody up too fast either. We want to do it gradually, step by step, over time. It has to be over certain time frames, of which you guys will, unless you're doing wilderness medicine, will not have to encounter the full extent of warming them up. Yes, you can. If you warm them up too fast, you can kill them because, and the reason being is that when you warm somebody up too fast, so let's think of it as, so I've frozen some water, right? When I unfreeze it, it kind of expands, right? It's not in that solid state anymore. When it expands, what is also in your cells? Fluid, there's fluid in your cells. So if that expands too rapidly, what happens to those cells? They burst. Yeah, they just fall apart, they break. Their membranes are not, not that durable. So they'll just start breaking apart. They'll start with red blood cells, they'll hemolyze, uh, he, the, it's called hemolysis. And I cannot say the other word for it, for whatever reason right now, <laughs> but it's hemolysis, okay? So these red blood cells will hemolysize. Here we go. And break apart. Um, it just basically means that it's breaking down. So now that we talked about our human popsicles, let's actually talk about hypothermia. So let's do like some benign hypothermia, right? I'm a little cold. Let's say my body temperature is like 90, 96 degrees, maybe 95, right? I'm cold. I was, I was out hiking in the mountains, right? And um, I didn't have the appropriate gear because people do that all the time and they get lost and who knows what else they get rained on, snowed on, whatever. So my body temperature is low. What does the body do to warm itself up? Sure. Yeah, I'm shivering. Why? What does it do? It produces heat. Specifically how? Yeah, so our muscles are kind of moving rapidly. We go, <laughs> we're tensing up and our bodies are, our, our muscles are contracting out a way to generate heat. Right, so we have that mechanism. 
Um, what else do you suspect that you would see in your patients with hypothermia? With benign, again, benign. Bluish grayish lips. Blue and discolored lips. So you would probably see that as a lip sign with more advanced stages of hypothermia. But that is a good point for when we get into that part next. So use of coloration of the skin. Okay. What discoloration do you think? Have you gone outside when it's cold? Have you seen somebody my complexion go outside when they're cold? Yeah, you get kind of red. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that happens? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And then what else will my body do? So other than vasoconstriction, because that is a very good point, we do eventually vasoconstrict but my blood vessels will actually try to open up to increase blood flow to that area to warm itself up. So now I'm trying to send in basically more body heat via my vessels to get myself warmed up, right? So that's, that's the first stage. I'm gonna open things up, right? Around the ears, especially, right? People's ears get red, nose, maybe a little bit on the cheeks, a little bit right? Because that's what exposed. And then you'll see it in the hands too, right? Your hands might get like a little red and might feel a little weird when you try to, you're doing this, There's like claw hands, right? They almost feel kind of swollen when you do that. When you get a little too cold, has anybody experienced that? Yeah, that's the increased blood flow. It's not because your vascular system's failing or that something's wrong with your heart. It's because you're trying to increase blood flow. So um, same thing with feet. However, hopefully your people will be wearing shoes when they go out into these environments, but definitely you will see it in toes. Toes are the, one of the first things that get frostbite. People forget about their toes. So what else do we expect in benign hypothermia? So we talked about discoloration. We're increasing some blood flow to different parts of our body. Wouldn't they have like a major memory lapse, depending uh, on how, like a, a major memory lapse? No, um, amnesia. Amnesia. Yeah, like depending um, on how far they're like into hypothermia. Yeah, they can, they can, because again, our our brain may decrease some of the blood flow, so. We may not be able to have some sort of some of the mental functions that we would normally have, um, but we would generally, generally they won't. They may be slightly confused starting off, but yeah, definitely later on they can have some amnesia. What else? What about their skin? Other than discoloration. Cold to the touch, right? You're going to be feeling your patients appropriately, people. So, right, we, you don't want to just go, my patient, of course, ask permission, and then go about your assessment. You're going to do a physical assessment, one of them being skin. You can visually inspect skin, and you will actually feel it for yourself. Right, because you go up to somebody and they're like, look, feel my hands before COVID, feel my hands, they're cold. And then you start trying to put them underneath your, your thighs, everything, sit on them, do whatever, try to warm them up, do this. Because this is friction, right? I just created heat. So now let's go a little bit further. Oxygen levels. What do you think is going to happen with oxygen? You think so? So, no, it won't go up. So with benign hypothermia, we may have a slight decrease, but however, it may stay within normal ranges. 
But again, remember we talked about cellular metabolism slowly slowing down. So you may see it dropping later on as they get more hypothermic. They start turning into that popsicle, right? Start going into that end. You want to keep them from that end. But definitely you can see a drop in oxygen levels. What about their heart? What do you guys think? Wouldn't they get hypotensive? Now you can't get hypotensive. Um, you could get hypotensive for so many different reasons. But for um, the dilation of the vessels? From the dilation of the vessels. Now, our vessels won't dilate quite that much, but you can have some lowered blood pressure because the colder that we get, now the slower our heart rate's getting too. Again, everything's starting to slow down. Think, think of cold as slowing things down, right? So now our heart rate may be dropping, but at first our heart rate may increase, right? Because now we're, we're trying to warm ourselves up. Now we're trying to work harder because we're trying to supply more blood flow to these areas that are cold. So you'll see an increased heart rate. They'll probably have a normal blood pressure starting off with hypothermia, benign hypothermia again. All right, the further along that we get, yeah. What's gonna happen to our cardiac output if our heart rate slows down? It's gonna decrease. So from there, you think that we're gonna see low blood pressure? Yeah, absolutely. You may see some weird things on the monitor too. You may see normal heartbeat and then boom. It's called a PVC. They'll start throwing PVCs. That happens when the heart gets irritated. It's usually from a lack of oxygen or some sort of other irritants. Usually treatments for PVCs are oxygen. We just throw them on some oxygen. So let's say, let me give you guys this. So now we have a patient. I will give you one of my patients, actually. This was a single vehicle rollover off of a cliff. Uh, just below Cloudcroft. OK, I used to work for AMR in Otero County. This was a single vehicle rollover um, just below Cloudcroft. The vehicle went over the edge, rolled, ejected my patient. One of the other patients was able to hike to a house. However, this happened in February. Guess where he landed? He landed in some snow, but guess what was next to him? A little creek because we had some of the snow melting. So now we have cold running water on my patient and snow and it's cold. And guess what? We didn't get to him till 12 hours after the accident actually happened. When I got to him, I thought he was dead. I was ready to move on to the vehicle. And then, uh, and I was like, oh my God, because you know, I thought he was dead, so zombie. <laughs> Then I'm like, oh no, oh crap. This guy's messed up. He's cold. I won't give you the whole list of injuries to treat, but he was cold. <coughs> so cold, he was 91 degrees. His buddy that was actually able to hike out with a broken back made a fire for him. He also had burns to him because the fire was built too close to him. But let's focus on the cold injury. So when I get to my patient, he is pale. He is tachycardic. He's got a heart rate of um, 142 with a blood pressure of 121 over 67 and his oxygen was 93 percent 
with a core temperature of 92 degrees. So what's our normal core temperature? 98.6, yeah, about that. Give, take, a, take or give a degree, right? Just depending. So now what are we worried about? This kid still has his clothes on that are completely soaking wet. He's 18 years old. We'll put in that. Um, he's got soaking clothes on. He's got some that are melted to his skin. What do you want to do? Would you close the clothing? The legal ones that are attached to the skin? So what's one of the ways that we lose heat? Think about it. If I have wet clothing on, how am I losing heat? Yes. So we want to get rid of those clothes, right? We want to try to get rid of as much as what of the elements as much as what we can. Unfortunately, we couldn't get this kid out of the environment completely because uh, Wrap. Hold on. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, guys, how about we do a real quick break and then I'll have Lou come back in with you guys. Okay, so 10 minutes. So meet back here at 3.03. Cool? Give you guys a break. I'll continue my story in a little bit, I promise. You guys are good for 10 minutes too. Sorry, teaching a class. <laughs> oh, let me grab my mask. Yes, I'm sorry, what was the question? No.
All right, kids. Sorry about that. Had to get stuff taken care of. Do I have most of my people? I'm just missing one. Do I have my online people now? I'm back. Yes. Yeah. I back. I was sorry. <laughs> Oh, I don't right now. Thank you. Oh, we've got a kiddo joining the class. We've got a She's going to be our honorary member. She say hi. Say hi. 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 <laughs> oh, you're so cute. <laughs> All right. So let's get back to my patient. So we remember, right, vehicle rollover. My patient was ejected from the vehicle as it was rolling because, of course, nobody wears seatbelts. Going down cliffs. Surprise, surprise. Gets ejected out of the side window, lands in some snow next to a nice little running creek of cold water. It's probably in the 30s or 40s around that time. It was around February. I remember this because I had just come back after having pulmonary embolisms. This was literally my first call after coming back from pulmonary embolisms and I had to hike three miles to the station. It was ridiculous. Get ready for your bodies to fall apart once you join EMS, just heads up. <laughs> oh, well girl, it's just gonna go haywire from here. That's all downhill once we become adults. So, all right, so my, my patient has some burns. He's hypothermic. He's in the 90s. His heart rate was in the, what did we say, 142. Uh, blood pressure was 121 over 67. He was satting 94 or 93, sorry. He was satting 93% on room air. Let's go. What do we do from here? You're saying you remove the clothing? Yeah, remove the clothing. Okay, remove the clothing. Should we put a heat blanket over there? Yeah, okay. definitely, yeah. Uh, Guess what I did? I built a little you We were down there for a long time. You built a fire. I built a fire. Guess what? I'm a smoker. So what do I have on me all the time? Oh, yeah. A lighter. Wouldn't you also wrap them in blankets once you take off the wet clothes? Yeah, we, we said wrap them in blankets. So preferably if you if you guys have this in your services, whoever you end up going to or whoever you end up riding with, sometimes they'll have uh, space blankets, right? Those nice tinfoil ones. What about those heat packs? You can use heat packs too. So anything you can turn them on. Yeah, literally anything. Again, I built a fire. With the heat pack, we put them in the same place where we put the cold pack? Mm-hmm. Because again, right, we've got a lot of blood flow to those areas. We've got some major arteries in here, behind these in the groins and the neck. Warm up the body fast, right? You just don't want to nilly willy just throw them on, right? You kind of want to put a little bit of a surface between the heat pack and the patient because sometimes those, those heat packs, when you burst them, it's just a chemical reaction that uses to heat it up. And sometimes they get really, really hot, so you don't wanna bring your patient to. So, right, so we could do that. What else? We're still out in the field. Oh, okay. Um, well, I can you're just going to lay on top of your patient? No. Just, no, hey, guy. Hey, let's anything, snuggle. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say anything, but let's be appropriate with our patients. So no snuggling your patients, guys. Okay. Wouldn't you place them on the backboard to get them off the cold floor? Good, good. Yeah, we're getting them off the ground. Put them on a backboard. So you guys haven't dealt with these yet, but I'm pretty sure there might be a picture in your book, if I remember correctly. We have something called a Stokes basket. So you can place your patient on a backboard and then you place them in the Stokes basket because that thing has handles on it. 
And I actually have pictures to show you guys because I took pictures. Oh, oh I did because I wanted to remember my trip on this page. So we'll get into that later. But so, okay, so we've removed him off of the cold ground. We've removed wet clothing. We've now wrapped him up. Get some heat packs going. What else? You reach Wouldn't you place on oxygen if needed? Yes. Does that hasn't been said already? No, that's not been said already, but yes, you do want to place him on oxygen because remember we said that he was satting 93. When do we want to place our patients on oxygen? And they're below 94. Yes, below 94. 94 or less. If they're at 94, cool, put them on oxygen. So, right, he's just a little low. So, what kind of oxygen would you want to put him on? What type? Two to four liters, Two to four liters nasal cannula. Excellent. Right, so I've got my O2 tank. I put him on oxygen. Now, what? Stop. See, Lou's leaving you guys. You guys are going to be mine soon. Very soon. Rapid transport. Additional resources. Help. <laughs> give me some help. I was a paramedic at this point. Still give me some help. <laughs> Even though I am the highest level, give me all of the help that I could need. Because guess what? This patient. But let me let me ask you guys this. So he was ejected in a rollover. And then landed. What do what else are we worrying about now? Spinal precautions. Great. Guess what happened when we rolled him and I inspected his spine? Do you want to know what I felt? Deformed. I felt crunchy. Crunchy is a no no, that's bad. This patient did live. His sister died though. She was dead in the vehicle just a couple of yards from him. And he kept on asking, what about my sister? So it was three people? It was four. At that point, would you tell the patient when they keep asking about the person, but you know that they're dead? So um, this is something that you will encounter. And this is something, and especially with a patient that is unstable like he was and as injured as he was, I was as vague as possible. Don't worry, we will get her out of here. Because guess what? Somebody was going to recover the body. Don't worry, we're worried about you right now. They've got her. Don't give any details, because guess what? Once you tell them, what's going to happen? They're going to freak out, and that's going to do nothing for your patient. Okay, so you just put all of the focus on them. Again, be vague as possible. Unless you're in the situation of where you're doing CPR and then you see resuscitation and then you have to tell a loved one, I'm sorry, but unfortunately, your loved one has passed away. That's the only time. But otherwise, yeah, I was as vague as possible. So final precautions. So now his back is broken. His neck and his back was broken in several places along with his ribs. Oh, and let's uh, let's do a full head to toe assessment. What do you guys want to know? All right. I Again, let's go head to toe. I would say the eyes for the dilation and constriction to see if there's any brain injury. Good, good. That's actually a, a great thing to assess. Um, no, his pupils were equal, round, and reactive to light. Pearl, right? So, 
don't have to worry too much about a brain injury, but you're still going to want to, yeah, palpate the skull. And you're also palpating, you want to look to see if there's any blood on your gloves or if there's any fluid coming out of the ears too, right? Yes, definitely do that. Um, do you, we're going a little bit into trauma now. Um, do, you, do you guys know about halo signs when you check the ears? Have you heard of that? No. Or goes to reveal spinal fluid? Yeah, you're looking for cerebral stimulus. So, what you do is a tiny pod in the ear, and then if it pulls out blood, but then you have a ring of almost this clear, maybe some yellow fluid, that's cerebral spinal fluid. That's an indication that they have a skull fracture. Okay, but he didn't have any of that. Great. What else? Palpate the face. Crunch. Right in here. And in here. What is that? You gotten that part yet? Maybe. This is these are called the fork fractures, and they go by grading. So depending on where the break is, we'll tell you what grade level Laporte fracture that is. So he did have Laporte fractures, but that is detached from the skull. So that's not a skull fracture, those are facial fractures. What fracture? Laporte. Is that for their trauma? It's in trauma, I promise. <laughs> so, um, you would do airway. Airway, great. He talked to me. So what do we know? It's clear and patent, right? He was speaking in full sentences, had no uh, dyspnea, right? So then, right, we know his airway's kind of good, right? But we put him on oxygen because it was kind of low. Could be from a couple of different factors, right? But we'll get into those. So now, We've moved on from the face and the skull. What's next? The neck. Neck. What do we assess in the neck? Tracheal deviation and what else? What's right there? Jugular vein distension. He had neither. What about the back of the neck? C-spine, right? Palpate the spine. I already told you, it's broken. What else do we want to assess? Going down. Start feeling the clavicles, right? Clavicles are good. Shoulders. Do they have PMS? Pulse motor sensation, right? Can you wiggle your fingers, toes? Can you feel me touching you? Can you squeeze everything? He could still move, so it didn't affect his spinal cord. All right, we're doing good so far. All right, what's next? After the clavicle, after we assess this, the chest, right? How are we assessing the chest? Okay, well, I mean, let's, let's start top down, okay? So you can usually, and especially for women, guys, especially guys, <laughs> Use the back of your hand if you're going to be lifting up the breast or doing stuff in here, okay? But otherwise, try to work around it because we've got a little bit more real estate to work with than you guys do, at least up here, okay? So we're gonna palpate the chest, right? I'm gonna feel here and in here, the sternum, and then move down along the ribs, right? And then sort of hook it, because what's in here? What connects the ribs and the sternum? Cartilage. Cartilage, thank you. <laughs> so like when they see you see during CPR, oh, you're gonna break ribs. No, you're not breaking ribs. You're actually separating cartilage off of the sternum. That's what that crack is, okay? So I feel some, and you guys tell me what this means, crepitus in here. 
crunchy. is crepitus. Crunchy, yeah, crunchy, crunchy's bad. Crunchy means broken bones. Okay, and with ribs, they're very painful, but you can't do anything about it. Patients will usually self splint, or you could do this if it's broken in a weird way. Again, we'll get into that in trauma. So let's not focus on that. What after the ribs? Oh, you, you almost skipped it. All right, so we're going to go to the abdomen, the four quadrants. Palpate, and you'll rotate, you'll and it'll hurt. You go in and in and in and in, and you rotate just like that. You're going to press hard. If it hurts your patient, guess what? It hurts your patient. But if you're able to gather more information, great. Okay, when you have the exposed skin, right? You're lifting up, looking for bruising, any ecchymosis, anything like that, right? What is ecchymosis? <laughs> okay, so ecchymosis is this kind of uh, discoloration, bruising almost type. It's, it's this burst of blood vessels. You'll see a better description of it in your book. There's actually a picture of it that's really nice and juicy. So um, you can look that up. So you have some ecchymosis and bruising. So that's just sort of indication of trauma, right? When I'm doing this, my patient's exposed. Since I'm already feeling him, what else am I assessing at the same time? Skin. Skin. Right? He's cold to the touch. So ding ding. Right? He's cold to the touch. All right, let's go further on assessing the pelvis. How do you assess the pelvis? Push in and push down. Why is this important? Good, an open book fracture. So, so you're in a supine position, press in, press down. Mm -hmm. So what this does, you press in, you could feel if there's any crunch from the sides. If you press down and you feel flexion in the hips, that means that there's a break and that's an open book fracture. If you press in and start feeling crunching, that usually means it's that nice rounded part to the hip in the pelvis. It means that's probably broken or it's that part, that ball and joint from the femur that connects into that hip socket. So you could assess whether it's that or open book, right? Okay, so none of that. So you move on to the legs. Right? Squeeze, 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 squeeze. All right, get down to the ankle. He's got burns to his right ankle and he's got an open fracture to his ankle. So his tip fib, actually. Okay. What else do we want to know? I've got his toes exposed. He's got some frostbite. Again, toes go first but it's not a degree. It wasn't to a degree of which he would have lost toes. It was savable. Okay. So now that I know all of this, what do you expect of your patient? What do you think? I'm on a hill, right? I'm down in a canyon. If we were to hike that patient out, we would have had to do it this way. Why don't I want to do that? What did you just do like that much in the Fly them out. There we go. Fly them out. And that's exactly what I did. But you know what I had to call for? I didn't just have to call for a helicopter. I ended up having to get a Black Hawk. Why? Yeah. 
Why do you think though? Think about these things. Think about the services that you have available to you. So if I don't want to hike my patient out, and the reason I didn't want to is because he had spinal injuries. Now, if we tilted him, that gravity could have shifted something in his spine just by weight alone. Okay, and then it definitely could have caused a spinal cord injury. So what did we do? We actually hoisted him out on the Stokes basket. So they airlifted him up from where we were. Somebody dropped down, tied him up, and then put him in the helicopter, took him down here to El Paso. Think about the resources that you have available to you and what you're able to do for your patients. If you're in over your head, call for help. I call for help. I need help all the time for so many different reasons. <laughs> so, we've gone over that. Let's see, heat, cold. Do you guys have any questions on those cold injuries? Does that make some more sense now that I present you with a cold patient and sort of what you would do? I'm not gonna go into full depth about my treatment because I did a whole lot more than that because I'm higher level than you guys. Um, Cause we did warm IV fluids, right? So was that cold and you said he had an open fracture? Mm-hmm. Splinted it There's and covered it. Open. Yeah, for those ones just, um, so now, again, once you get into trauma, trauma's fun for you EMTs, because then you get to play more. You get to play a whole lot more than you do in medical. Um, and that's your time to shine, guys. I promise you, you'll have fun. And that is where you're gonna become strongest. Now, when you go into advanced, and if you go onto a paramedic level, Oh boy, does medicine get fun. It does, but I still love my trauma. I still do to this day. Now, when you're thinking about that, so now again, you mentioned he's got an open fracture. What do you do with it? Also, now what do we have to consider? He's got an open fracture to his tip fib. Is he losing heat from that as well? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why do you think? What protects our body? Skin. So now I have that break in my skin. So now I'm going to lose more heat through that injury, right? Because now my body is unable to contain it. So think about those things. Um, because your your tra your trauma patients, especially. Let me get into it again. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, keeping your trauma patients warm is extremely important because it will prevent shock. And we do not want people to go into shock. That is what we want to prevent because then the body just the processes just go crazy and it'll get away from you and you'll get in over your head. So Treat these before they get bad. And if you think it's going to go south, even yell for help. Dude, I when I was an EMT, I used to call for dumb shit. Because I didn't know. I would baby EMT, just like you guys. I used to call for dumb shit. My supervisor would be like, oh, you're an idiot, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? I got better. And it took time. Holy shit, it took time. But guess what? It took a couple of months of like really getting comfortable and into it and then oh i started getting the hang of it yeah until something throws you through a loop again <laughs> it's gonna happen guys okay i expect you guys to know these things however your students you get a little bit of a break but i also want you really to study this i want to make it fun for you guys too i don't want to just sit here and lecture at you guys all of the time okay so if you can, guys, if you can do this for me, if you can 
really be on top of studying and really being on top of work and really being on top of participating, answering questions, starting doing this, started, you know, like we were doing. I actually, from my teaching experience, like to do games. Okay, teaching games with my EMT students. I've got things planned for you guys. Are you the instructor or you're just I will be taking over. So, um, I think starting next week is when I'll officially be taking over because this week is kind of a little crazy because again, I'm also the EMS coordinator, right? So um, I'm dealing with fixing up and do it and setting up and making sure that's running smoothly. So this week, once that's done, then I get more time for you guys. Of which more time of which I'll dedicate for you all which I have special, maybe torturing things planned for you. Uh, yes. Can we just get a little bit more scenarios? I know, like, I don't know if you want to do, like, hands on scenarios, but just what you're doing right now is good. I like that. I feel like it works better with the scenarios. If, if that is the way that you guys learn, absolutely. You tell me what is best for your education. Again, I am here for your education. If that, again, is going to help you learn, absolutely, we can do that. Again, I still have to lecture at you guys, make sure that you know the material. But yeah, I'll throw in scenarios. I'll do this. I'll do that. Hell yeah, we'll do it. And um, maybe kind of get us out of our comfort zone so all of us don't like to sit up much. Um, yeah, I'm going to be picking on you guys. Again, I don't know everybody's names, and I apologize. I forget names all the time. I sometimes forget my own name, again, because I probably go, like, by three. Um, so, uh, you know, I apologize, but I'll get there. Okay? But we are going to make this interactive. I'm going to get you out of your comfort zone. Okay? I have things planned that I want to do, because I want to get you guys up to date on your drugs, right? You need to know your drugs, guys. Okay? We might have some drug games. Sounds kind of weird. Not those type of drugs, but your EMT drugs, okay? So what I like to do, and we might have to improvise because of COVID, right? We have to do social distancing. So I might ask you guys to bring in some paper. And I might write on the board, we'll do a tic-tac thing. And I might have you throw a piece of paper at the board and wherever it lands, then you're going to have to tell me about that drug. I'll split you guys into teams. You guys get points. Whoever wins, I don't know, gets candy. I don't, I don't know what I can think of to give you guys, but whatever. <laughs> give, give extra points, whatever. Whatever you guys want. We can make it as interactive as possible while you still are learning. Okay? So we'll do more scenarios. We'll do some of those fun games that kind of gets you guys on top of your shit, right? So that's what I expect of you. Do more scenarios. And then of course, we're gonna have the labs where we're gonna do hands-on skills. Okay. And I'm not super stringent on things. I've been in the game for a while now, and I may have yelled at maybe another class the other day, and women especially, I'll expect a lot out of you. Because guess what? I grew up in the game when this was still a man's job. So guess what I heard a lot? Oh no, honey, you can't do that. Honey, you can't lift that person. And you know what I was? Screw you. Yeah, I can. And I'd lift that 300 pound patient into the ambulance by myself. So I expect a lot out of my women because you gotta give us, you gotta, you guys gotta give us a good name. All right, and you guys too. I still expect a lot out of you guys too. I promise I'm not, I'm not playing, I, I'm not sexist. <laughs> okay. So, but yeah, we'll definitely do some more scenarios. Do you guys online have any questions? Oh. No. No. Oh. Okay. Anything for you guys that you would like to add as far uh, as would be better for your teaching? Uh, Learning. Okay.
other than her chiming in with her stuff. <laughs> so let's do another one. Let's do another heat emergency. All right, I'm gonna go back and forth. Now you guys can write this down, log it on your phones as far as symptoms and everything. But let's say that we have a 28 year old female. Okay, and let's say it's July and it's currently 103 degrees outside. Now I'm gonna make this about my friend. So let's say that she went jogging because she's part of the fire department. So she has to keep up with her physical fitness. She's jogging outside. She starts experiencing the cramps and thinks she could just muscle through it. And she passes out and a bystander calls 911. Let's go. Arrive on scene. Scene safety, no issues. Check for a pulse. What are you forgetting? BSI, thank you. You guys on your national registry, it is going to be so stupidly redundant. BSI scene safe. BSI scene safe. BSI scene safe. Start your scenario. Cool. <laughs> so we've got. Our scene safety. We've got gloves on. What else? Check for a pulse. We've got a pulse. Where are you checking it? Carotid? Yes. So we're checking it at the carotid. Okay, so you've got a nice, strong, bounding pulse. And it's pretty fast. Okay, yeah, she's directly in the sun. She passed out right there. Let's see, she's jogging along a canal because I live in Las Cruces. Can you do that first and then check the pulse? You could do either. Yeah. So, right, we've removed her from the environment. Okay, so let's say that we found a tree with some shade. Okay. We've checked a pulse. It's strong and bounding at the carotid. What else? Check for skin signs. Before that, before that, remember airway breathing, circulation. Check for a open and patent airway. Open and patent airway. Okay, she is breathing shallow and very rapidly. Start taking vitals. Start taking vitals. Okay, what do you want to know? Blood pressure. Okay, let's say her blood pressure is registering 60 over nothing. Oh no! Right? Butthole just puckered a little. <laughs> what else? <laughs> What's her skin condition? Skin condition? All right, well, we'll say skin condition, right? Because you can assess that at the same time as you're checking a pulse, right? Because you're touching your patient. Okay. So, her skin condition is dry and hot to the touch. And then because somebody asked for blood pressure and pulse and SpO2, well, actually, we already did blood pressure. So, pulse is going to be 130. And our SBO2 is going to be 96% on room air. Respirations, good. So respirations are going to be 28 and shallow. And if you start positive pressure ventilation at that point, it's just. What's her oxygen? At that point, wouldn't you help breathe for her if her respiration's at 28? So that, yes, that was asked. So I will tell you guys this. Now, if they are shallow, rapid, and they're not oxygenating well, absolutely. But if they're maintaining their oxygen status, 
leave them as is because guess what? What do you think is going on with your patient? They're compensating, right? Because their blood pressure just dropped, right? So now, now I'm breathing really fast, but my oxygen's okay. So there's nothing wrong with my um, oxygenation. There's nothing wrong with the depth. It's just the rate. So even though I'm saying shallow, it's because it's so fast. Okay, so you can you can determine that based off of your patient. So we don't need to bag this patient. She's oxygenating well. Okay. What we need to do is, are we thinking that our patient's in shock? Yeah. So shock also produces an increase in respirations, right? So maybe do we want to handle that shock before we start getting really aggressive? Yeah. Start slow, guys. Start slow, right? Work up into these things. Get your pieces of information and then um, do the appropriate treatments for them, okay? So now that we've got that out of the way, what else do you think? She's hot, dry to the touch. She's a little flush. She's not sweating. Despite it being 103 degrees outside and she was just jogging. Yeah. Why heat stroke and not heat exhaustion? Yeah, we're not sweating anymore, huh? Okay, good. Now, what do we do? Shock position, that's a good one because right, our blood pressure's low. Let's let's get more of that blood to the core. Call back up. Call back up. Thank you, right? We're saying that we're EMT basics. So what do you think that your patient needs? Uh, yeah, at the very least, right? An IV. So which you can't do. Call for backup. Great, we've got backup. But guess what? They're 20 minutes away. Dang traffic. So you will see this in your scenarios when you do the NREMT testing. So we will say, OK, you've got ALS intercept. They are 20 minutes away, but you are 10 minutes away from the hospital. What's more appropriate for your patient? Wouldn't you try and cool them down? Yeah, we would definitely try to cool them down, but we're talking about the transport thing for a little bit. So if your intercept is further away than where you are from your location to the hospital, load them up and go. All right. So, right, we called for backup and we determined that they're useless to us right now. Well, we could get to the hospital faster. So let's say now we're loading up and getting into the back of the truck. So now, like she said, we're going to start cooling down our patient. How are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. AC is possible. Yeah, we can use some AC. Hopefully the truck has AC. Hopefully, because it's a hot day. Wouldn't you just rope them in as much as possible to keep them modest at the same time and the cooling rods and the ice packs? Say that first part again. Uh, 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 strip them from their clothing as much as possible while keeping them modest. Yeah, you definitely can. So the nice thing in EMS is that we could take people's clothes off legally. In an appropriate manner, guys, okay? So I've seen EMTs do inappropriate things with patients, and guess what? They lose their license. So don't be that guy or girl. <laughs> I don't judge. <laughs> so don't be that person. But yes, you can absolutely start stripping them because, yeah, you're going to expose their skin to hopefully a cooler temperature. Hopefully. All right. So because our clothing actually does help preserve some body heat, right? So let's get that off of them. Cool, we've got her down. So usually if you do that, at least 
be a decent person and cover them with a nice hospital sheet. They're useless at preserving heat if you've ever been a hospital patient and they give it to you. So that's perfectly fine, especially if you're stripping somebody down just to preserve some dignity, because if it was you, right, you'd feel uncomfortable with somebody just staring at you while you're in your underwear, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know that uh, unless you're a nudist, which I mean, I guess more power to you, but most people aren't, right? And especially in the society and the culture that we're in with the Hispanic culture, very, very private, especially women. Okay, so do that. So we're pulling our patient, we're transporting, we're doing this, we're putting them in a shock position, we elevated their feet to hopefully get some blood flow back to their body. So let's say, what else after that? What are you wanting to do other than that? Reassess, thank you. How often do you want to reassess this patient? Three to five minutes. Right, because they're they're kind of unstable, right? Their blood pressure's crap. So we want to get things going, right? We want to we want to start trending to see how well they're doing with the what we're able and capable of doing. So let's say her blood pressure is improving, and now she's able to talk to you. Sample, OPQRST, ask some questions. All right, get some medical history, allergies, medications. Last oral intake, that's always something I forget to ask unless they're a diabetic, then I ask it, but you know, please put that on your reports when you do it. It may be a stupid question to ask people, but just do it. And then events leading up to what happened, so right. What were you doing beforehand? Have you drank anything? Are you able to maintain water? Are you able to hold it down? Do you feel nauseous? Are you having cramps? Anything like that? What else are we forgetting, guys? Vital sign wise. You could check a blood sugar, right? Uh, so these heat and these cold emergencies do make the body process sugar a little bit differently. So yeah, you can definitely check a blood sugar, but what else? It's hot. Temperature, thank you. There we go. So we got a temperature. Ah, oh, temperature is 103. Woo, that's hot. So, but we already got the cooling down. So we want to keep on reassessing the temperature because we're actively cooling our patient, right? But we don't want to create too much of a drop. Okay. Do you think that you did everything appropriate for this patient of what you're capable of doing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you guys did really good. Okay. A little bit of coaching, but you're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. So once you have all of the equipment in front of you, you could be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a blood pressure. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get this. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do that. It's easier when you have a real person in front of you. Okay, uh, kind of hard with our whole COVID precautions, but I promise we'll get you there. Okay, so let's, let's talk about something else now. What in our environment do we have around here? in a desert, snakes. What do we want to know about snakes? Yeah, generally I call them angry ropes or nope ropes. You don't mess with that nope rope. Mm -mm. So, but generally um, in an EMS setting, if you can get any identifying information about that snake, cool. So then we can know about what type of anti-venom that that person could need if they end up with a snake bite, right? So what are we concerned about with snakes, especially in this area? Rattlesnakes, what do we have specifically? I 
I know we have them in New Mexico. Well, not well. We do have spiders. We do have some venomous spiders in the area, like brown recluses. Scorpions. We have scorpions. Most of the ones in these areas are not deadly. However, they are very venomous, and the stings will make your muscles seize up. They affect muscle. But let's go back to our snake bites. Snake bites. There's different types of venom for different types of snakes. So, and they're categorized differently. Some of them of which destroy tissue. And some of which will attack nerves. Okay, so snake bites can get really nasty, right? Have you, has anybody ever seen a snake bite before? Other than in TV? No? Okay, I've only dealt with a few, a few ever, because usually people they are look good. Like pit bulls. Yeah, some of them are like those almost pit bull looking vipers. But guess what? Some people like to keep exotic pets, and then when they get too big or they get too problematic, guess what they do? They do release them into the desert, and they're like, hey, be free. But if they're not native to the area, guess what? It causes a problem for the people, especially if they're poisonous. So the one that we particularly have exposure to here is the diamondback rattlesnakes. It's this part of Texas, new, the lower part of New Mexico, and into Arizona. So their venom specifically will eat away at tissues. Okay, so you'll actually, you will see a very gradual increase of tissue death. You could see it happen over hours, okay? So it may start out as those just two nice little puncture bites and you're like, ooh, that looks bad and it's red and raised and then all of a sudden it turns into this ulcer that venom's eating away at everything now guess what that venom's doing once it's injected into the body what happens from there think of it as almost like a shot it ends up in the bloodstream how is that a big no-no Yeah, and then what is the heart? It's, yeah, it's tissue. It's muscle, right? So it's going to start affecting the heart. Some of them, the venoms will create the blood to clot. Some other ones will actually act as a blood thinner but in a very bad way. Remember how I told you earlier about the destruction of red blood cells, how they'll fall apart? Some venoms will do that as well. So basically, the patient bleeds out internally from everywhere, which we can expect is very problematic because you know we're supposed to use our blood, right? Kind of need those red blood cells for oxygen. So, what do we do for snake bites? Run away. Say, nope, not going to deal with it. Call poison control. That's great. Right, and they're going to ask you that same sort of thing. Do you know what type of snake it was? Can you describe it to me? How long ago did it happen? And they'll actually direct you as to sort of how to treat them. Poison control is a great option for overdoses, snake bites, bug bites, spider bites, whatever you can think of. Any type of thing that's not supposed to be in the body, you can contact poison. Okay, and you'll learn to remember that number or you'll have it programmed in your phone. I have it programmed in my phone. So, we've contacted poison control. Let's say that the patient literally just got bit five minutes ago. What do you expect to see? Red. Redness, right? It's irritated. We just got a puncture. 
but now our body's starting to react to that venom. It's almost kind of like an allergic reaction, right? It's gonna get red and raised and it's gonna be angry. It's, and it's extremely painful for the people that get bit. It's very hard to do pain control for them. So they're gonna complain of pain, redness, swelling, what else do you think? Anybody? So once I have something, a foreign substance in my body, my body's gonna start reacting to it. So I might get a little tachycardic, right? Okay, so my heart rate's gonna raise. And then at first, right, cause my heart rate raised, my blood pressure may raise a little bit too, right? First signs. Mm -hmm. So what is something you, you guys may have seen it before or heard about it or had somebody talk to you about it or maybe seen it on TV? When we have a snake bite and we see it as medical professionals, what do we do to it? Circle it, thank you. So we're gonna circle it, right? We're gonna circle around the area of redness and mark the time. If that increases, mark it again, and mark that time again, because you wanna see how fast that venom's spreading. We'll do this in a pre-hospital setting because this helps the hospital out and know how fast it's spreading through the system, okay? So once we do that, what else do you think we could do for snake bites? Are we gonna suck out the venom? Are we gonna to go to our patient and go? <laughs> Slightly less, I like that. So yeah, we definitely don't place tourniquets on snake bites. Why do you think? Huh? Yeah, tourniquets are mainly used for bleeding. So back in the day, they used to say, apply a tourniquet because then it'll stop the spread of venom. That doesn't really stop it. Now, what we have to worry about when we, um, when we place tourniquets is the loss of blood flow. So our cells aren't able to circulate, right? The toxins that it's picking up and then throwing back into the body and filtering it, right? Now I'm building it up all into one central area. I'm actually making it worse. Now I'm building up the toxins that my body would naturally produce in these situations, along with my venom too. So according to the American Heart Association, you are going to use a constricting band, not a tourniquet. The band of usual IV? No but it's almost kind of similar. You're not gonna place it as tight. Um, and you would place it just above the area of where the bite happened. So say it happened on my leg, like right here, and just place it right above. Kind of in the same concept of the tourniquet within one to two inches um, above the area of injury, right? So and you don't tight, tight, whatever. Um, Is it like when they take blood? Uh, yeah, but again, a little bit less. A little bit less. Yeah. As long as you have something that's thick enough, again, because you don't want to use fire, you don't want to use anything like that, anything that's going to destroy the tissue or break it apart, especially, you know, younger kids, her skin's a little bit more sensitive, or even in the elderly where the skin's very fragile. So you don't want to cause skin degradation. Okay. Um, so we just place a nice, thing, hold on one second. Okay, so we can place the constricting band. What else? My area is raised and hot and angry. What else? What else do you think? Just pops into your mind. So, okay. Let me ask you guys this. If I, if you twist your ankle, right? You're running, you twist your ankle. What do you put on it? 
ice. We can put ice directly on a snake bite. What do you think? Lower the pain? Yes, actually, very good. It does lower the pain, right? Because we're kind of not freezing things, but it dulls those nerves, right? So we're dulling the nerves, so it's helping with the pain. It's also helping with that swelling too, because we want to take down some of that swelling. Um, so it will help you in those circumstances. So yes, let's place an ice pack over that area. Now, if it starts oozing and weeping, and now you've got all this fluid leaking from your snake bite, what are you gonna do? Think about wound care. Bandage, let's put a bandage on it, right? Because now we're oozing, weeping, gross stuff that you don't want on you or to, you know you don't want to poke at it. Don't do that. Don't poke at things. I've done that. I've poked at things and you don't want to poke at certain things. So you don't want those fluids on you, right? And you don't want them leaking out because they can start bleeding from that site depending on the venom. Again, right? So then we'll take care of that bleeding control. Uh, not right away, not, not, not quite this fast, but you will see that either some plasma with a little bit of red blood cells, so that plasma, you know, that nice serosanguinous fluid that's kind of yellow, like, you know, you, have you ever gotten a scab and then picked it and it's just that clear kind of fluid? You'll see that leaking from it. So you'll have that kind of stuff leaking from it with maybe a little bit of blood maybe it degrades a little bit further and now you're having greater tissue damage so you definitely want to cover that area what else do we want to do with snake bite victims what is a thing that we can do that may not be necessarily a medical intervention huh Support. supportive care you want to calm your patient. Why? If I get anxious, what's happening to me? What does my heart do? Speed up. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, oh my God, I just got bit by a snake. I'm going to die. It spreads faster. Yeah, yeah definitely. So we're going to offer supportive care. We're going to comfort that it's going to be okay all right we're gonna don't don't pet your patient but definitely be like it's okay right we don't pet people i've had people come up to me oh your hair's so pretty and start petting me and i'm like oh god don't pet them that's creepy <laughs> but definitely offer emotional supportive care seems dumb but everybody forgets about it right we want to be empathetic for our patients because you're going to see all sorts of situations that you're going to have to almost play counselor to. Oh, your boyfriend broke up with you. I'm sorry. Oh, you don't need him. Blah, blah, blah. This and that. Play your best friend. Because guess what? It calms him down. So, right, I'm reducing my anxiety for my patient. So that being number one. Okay, right. So we do that first. Because we don't want them to be anxious about this to spread the venom faster and then get it circulating in their system even more and just making things worse or hypoventilating and then passing out and then you're like, well, dang it. <laughs> so let's comfort our patient. We'll do the rest, keep them calm, try to keep their heart rate down. As long as they're in an area, don't, if, they, if you can carry them out, walk them out, whatever, get the stretcher there, cool. If they have to walk out, because I've had issues of where people have had to walk out of the desert, it kind of is what it is, you know, but we want to try to avoid that. Because, you know, again, that physical activity is going to increase their heart rate. It's going to spread it faster. So we're doing all of this. What else do you think that you guys can do? Anybody say call for help? I don't remember if you did either, but I'm just saying call for help. 
Maybe, I don't know. I threw a couple of scenarios at you and we did the whole resource thing. So um, yeah, we called for help. All right, get them going, get them comfortable, get them to the hospital, rapid transport. Okay, simple enough. Uh, yeah, if you can, <laughs> definitely. Especially when it comes to, again, National Registry skills sign on. Call for help in your scenarios. Okay, it'll save you. It gives you an extra point. Cool. All right, so what about spider bites? So, right, I've got my snake bites that look like these nice little fangs. They're two little, boom. What about spider bites? Has anybody seen a spider bites? Yeah, they're a little tiny, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they can. So, what do we do with spider bites? There we go. It's pretty much the same as a snake bite. Minus the constricting band. We don't, we don't do that for spider bites. Spider bites act totally different, and they're so small, it's on the surface of the skin. So um, they're not quite puncturing quite as far, right? So we do have a couple of poisonous spiders in the area. Do we know what they are? There's a big one that probably everybody will get. Well, the brown recluse. What's the other one? Black widow. Black widow. There we go. So are black widows deadly to adults? They can be to somebody that is susceptible to it or has some underlying medical conditions, but otherwise you'll probably just get a little sick. But otherwise the elderly, again, the elderly and kids and pets, they are actually very deadly too. Completely different. As an adult, we can, we can deal with the venom. It'll cause a lot of muscle cramps spasms, you'll have diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, all of that fun stuff. That's not so fun. So yeah, you're going to treat it the same. Keep your patient calm. And sometimes people are going to call. I got bit by a by this tiny little spider and it's totally not poisonous, but they're going to freak out. What are you going to do? Supportive care. There you go. I have been to those cases where it is entirely bullshit call. And you know what? I put a smile on my face and I'm like, yes, ma'am, let's get you to the hospital. Even though I know that they're going to get discharged in like an hour. Because guess what? It's my job to comfort them and at least get them to a higher level of care. Because guess what? I'm not a doctor. I can't say, I can't rule out definitively that it's bullshit, right? But just to be on the safe side, just take it. Cool. Don't fight with them. Don't this and that. You'll probably see it from salty people out in the streets. No, you don't need to go blah, 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 this and that, and they'll try to talk them out of it. The most legal responsibility that you'll ever have on you is a patient care refusal. Because you didn't transport them, but they called 911. They can say, Oh, well, they told me not to go, but what if that patient died later on? No, it doesn't. The no. The refusal mostly says, so you have to hit key points in it. I explained to you that you are going to, that um, I explained, and how I word it, is I will say you are vitally or your vitals are within a normal range. I will not say everything looks good because I can't definitively say that everything looks good. I don't have x-ray vision. I don't have a CT. I didn't run laps. So I can't say everything was good. I can say your blood pressure, your pulse, your oxygen was good. I could even look at an EKG, but still. That's not on you guys. So I can say this and I'll explain the reasons as to um, we explained, hey, you probably should go get checked out to be on the safe side. But if you don't want to go, um, you can um, you can be completely stable. However, call us back at any point of time and um, 
if anything happens, just to know that if you do not get evaluated by a medical doctor or a DO, whatever, um, by somebody of higher and more medical education than myself, if you do not do that, it can lead up to serious injury and or death. And that's ex what I explain to my patients when I do a refusal. And if they say, oh, OK, and sign it anyways, I have to put in my document that I said this, 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 and I'll usually ask them three times. Are you sure you don't want to go to the hospital? You know, you sure? I mean, you called 911. We're here. We can take you. No, no. All right. Well, you could call us back. That sort of thing. And then you have to document every aspect of it. If you go over and you say, here, just sign this piece of paper. That doesn't protect you. Nothing. They can always come back and if they end up finding you negligent, there goes that license that you were just in class to work on. So be careful. That is the most legal responsibility that you'll ever have on you as a patient refusal. But anyways, we're going over environmental emergencies. That was a sidebar. OK, so snake bites, same exact treatment that we're going to do. Yep. Yeah, you can. It's just like you said. Yep, just minus the constricting band. OK, and then patient comfort. Oh, fever. fever, you can definitely see fever in these patients. Um, usually it's not rapid onset, but some people say, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad. So, you know, I'm good. And then they'll call when they're sick. So you can see a fever. They can, they can, their body can be reacting to it and trying to fight it off, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be an infection, but that's the body's response to trying to fight it. Okay. So yeah, you can absolutely see a fever. Now what else? Anybody know? Call for help. Call, yeah, definitely call for help. Yeah. All right. Any, any time, just help. <laughs> Anybody, somebody in the black box, send me help. Because it's going to happen anytime. You know, but mostly when you guys work on the truck, you're going to be paired with somebody of a higher licensure level than you, or at least in the systems that I've worked in, there's always at least been. Uh, and I'm old school. I was back when it used to be called intermediate instead of advanced DMT now. So there used to be an intermediate or a paramedic on the truck in all of the systems that I've worked. So um, let's see more environmental emergencies. Uh, what would you guys consider for your own safety with environmental emergencies? Because remember, it's you first, your partner, the public, and then the patient, right? Which seems kind of weird because most people's answer, why did you get into this? I wanted to help people. But now we're all of a sudden making the patient on the last on that list. Why? Yeah, if we get screwed up, then we can't help anybody else. And then now we're depleting resources from somebody else because now an ambulance has to come and haul my ass away. So what's some environmental factors that you want to consider for yourself? So let's say, all right, it's that hot summer day. What are you going to consider for yourself? Hydrated. Stay hydrated, right? So we're going to do those self care techniques. That way we don't become the next victim. Right, we're in a truck that hopefully has AC. So cool. All right. Maybe we're wearing short sleeves, right? Summer. If I wasn't in a professional setting, I'd definitely be in shorts right now. I keep my house at 67 degrees because I am hot all the time. Okay. But well, what else do we want to consider, right? So it's heat, it's sunny, right? You want to cover up, you got sh you got sh shades on, right? I can't see in the sunlight. Got to put on those hater blockers. 
right, you may get a hat. I usually wear a hat out in the sun. I have lupus, so I usually get a rash right here on my face if I don't. Stuff like that, sunblock, whatever. Uh, I have enough Hispanic genes in me to where I at least don't burn in the sun. My freckles just start connecting the dots, is what I call it as a tanning. Um, but, so right, we could do some of those things. Now, what about cold? Wear a jacket, a beanie, maybe some gloves. I used to get, because of course, when I worked in Alamogordo, we covered all of Otero County. So we went up into Cloudcroft and Timberon and those areas up into Rio Doso. So it snowed a lot. Guess what I wore? Knee high wool socks. Because there's often times that we're going out into the snow. Because guess what? Deer and elk like to run out into the highway and play Frogger in traffic. That happens all the time all the freaking time. So we would often have to deal with those cold emergencies. And when that happens, you have to protect yourself. So get a jacket, nice warm jacket. You got your gloves, you got your beanie. Um, I would also, like this gentleman back here, has this. I used to wear those too for around my neck and my face because that wind chill will hit you hard. We're no talking like the old shoe, like that looks like tennis I came, rackets. I came from you know, truck driving, so I don't wear a lot of stuff. They, they saved my ass a couple of times. We never went that far. <laughs> um, if it took us to where we were in a snowy condition like that, it was like, ah, oh, screw it, call search and rescue. <laughs> Make them deal with it. Because you have to protect yourself. If, if you're in a lot of services, they'll tell you, okay, don't hike to your patients, don't do this, don't do that. And it's because you don't want to get taken out. Right? Again, we can't help somebody if we get injured. So what about when it rains? Guess what? Everybody apparently gets stupid when it rains in the desert. Right? Lots of accidents. Everybody sliding around on the roads slamming into things, maybe they drive into tree, because you know trees just pop out in front of everybody all the time. I got it all the time when I worked in Anthony. So if it's raining, again, you want to wear a jacket, right? You don't want to end up soaking wet. I promise you, when you're going on these shifts, take a change of uniform, because you're either, you either might get soaked, might sweat through it, somebody might bleed on you, somebody might puke on you, um, somebody actually might piss on you. I've only had that happen once. Um, intentionally. Psych patients are a bitch, man. <laughs> so take a change of uniform with you just in case. Always carry one with me in my vehicle. Okay, so you want to do that. So if it's raining outside and you're on a traffic scene, Okay, say you're out on I-10 and somebody's lit off the road, they slammed into another vehicle, you're trying to deal with it. Now what are you concerned with yourself? Yeah, because could you end up having a vehicle slam into you? What does everybody do when they see lights and sirens? They look. They bottleneck. Right? They slow down. Oh, what's going on there? And then boom. And usually when you're looking, you tend to go, huh? They can drive right into you. A lot of officers die every year for stopping for traffic accidents or even just traffic stops on the side of the highway because then somebody's looking at them and then they end up running right into them. So Paramount safety is your number one priority, okay? So, and snow, same thing. It ices over here. Everybody starts skating around when they're going in their vehicle. I used to go into the mall parking lot when it would ice over and start doing donuts in the ambulance. 
I got in. Tr I did that until I got in trouble for it. <laughs> May not happen so much here. I've only had El Paso ice over while I've worked here once, but it definitely happened in these other places that will you encounter. Ooh, you do like you were saying. Like, you know, like, the just try to park the ambulance and try to. So what you'll do is you'll actually position the ambulance in a way that when you pull up, so right, you have your traffic scene over here, point the nose end towards the traffic scene and the back end is sticking out towards traffic. That way when the driver gets out, they're blocked by the ambulance and then the other person still ha has view of oncoming traffic. So that's how you do that. If you park parallel, that person opening up the driver door, it could just go boom and rip off if another vehicle is right there. So those are just things you want to consider. Okay. Um, what else for environmental? Anything that I forgot to cover? Wind. Oh my God, wind. Now let me tell you. So when I was working AMR for Doniana County, I uh, was working with one of my supervisors. He was a very awesome paramedic. And uh, we went up to Hatch. Our other supervisor at the time was like, hey, you want to go up to Hatch to have a chill shift? Like, it'll, it, they never get any calls, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what happened? We got a call. Always happens to me. We got three calls that night. They didn't sleep. <laughs> so, so much for that. So, we go out to hatch, and when I go out to hatch, there was a storm that came through that actually had hurricane force winds. It was like 90 mile an hour winds. It was very unusual. And guess what the heck kind of ambulance I'm in? I'm in a Twinkie, is what I call them. They're the ambulances. They sway side to side when the wind hits them the wrong way. And we had to go pick up a patient that had been ejected. I don't know why I'm coming up with all of these ejection uh, stories all of a sudden. But yeah, this patient got ejected into a field. And uh, because flight wasn't available, we were going to transport him down to UMC ourselves. Um, and my very encouraging paramedic partner, because I was an EMT at the time, uh, tells me, please don't kill us. And I'm like, nope, that doesn't make me more nervous at all. Not at all. But guess what? These are things that you have to consider. You've got dust flowing in your eyes. You've got other vehicles that are going to end up slamming into you. If the visibility is low, you just slow down. But yeah, wind emergencies do happen. Uh, they, especially here, freaking desert. Hate it. So, but otherwise, other than stuff like that, it's just considerations and logistics on your part. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now let's throw one more scenario at you guys before we release you. How does that sound? So, let's see. Did you guys go into water emergencies? Okay, well, let's real quick. Let's go over that. That's easy. Cool. I knew I was forgetting something. I was like environment, environment, environment. And then I started thinking about it and I was thinking about the scenario and I was like, oh, wait, water. Duh. It's kind of what we need to live. But so let's go over water emergencies real quick. Um, so I used to also, I, guys, I've been all over the place. I tell you, I have very extensive <laughs> EMS history and career. Um, I used to work at Elephant View. Okay, so the lake's up there. So, drownings, right, is something that we have to consider and that, that we deal with. May not happen so much here, but every time that the river fills up, it can happen. Or even in pools, too. Any body of water, because kids do that, they could drown in the bathtub. So, 
what is a concern that we have when we're drowning? Or when somebody has drowned, not necessarily yourself. What do we have to consider in drowning emergencies? Airway, thank you. Because what do people do when they freak out? They go, if I'm underwater and I do that, I don't have gills, I can't breathe underwater. So my lungs are gonna fill up with water, right? It takes a little bit for somebody to become unconscious while they're actively drowning, um, but it can happen with, within no time. People panic, they'll struggle, but depending on currents and everything like that, or even kids that don't know how to swim or how to float, some people don't know how to float. So we're gonna end up getting water in our lungs, which is just gonna bog us down even more because we're usually the human body's fairly point. So if I get a bunch of water in my lungs, what's gonna happen? They're not necessarily gonna collapse, but I'm not gonna be able to breathe. I'm not gonna be able to oxygenate well. So say you get this person out of the water. What can you do to get that water out of their lungs? You can suction their airway, right? If they have water in their airway, you can suction. Yeah, we could place them on their side. We could try to let gravity get a hold and sort of help us out, right? But otherwise, if somebody's drowned, sort of think about it if somebody was choking. Think back to your CPR class, guys. So if I was choking and I became unconscious, what do you then do? Compressions. I heard you whisper it, say it louder. If you think you're right, say it louder. Even if you don't think you're right, speak up please. Cause then we could even discuss wrong answers too. I, I love wrong answers. We learn from wrong answers. So, Right, I'm gonna do compressions just like I'm doing choking. When I'm compressing the chest, what is that also doing? It's pumping the heart. But what it what's in my chest cavity? My lungs. So if I'm doing a compression here, I'm also sort of compressing my lungs too. So you're going to be pushing out water from their lungs. So you're going to want to do that. And very active, you know, drowning patients that are especially unconscious. Okay, do that. And hopefully it's not dramatic like the TV shows or the movies where I just go <laughs> and then all this water comes out. No, it doesn't go like that. But hopefully we may get something up and then it will able to be able to passively oxygenate them. Now, if that doesn't happen, but I'm not breathing, what are you going to do? Breathe for them. How are you going to do it? Positive pressure ventilation. All right, I'm going to get my handy dandy BVM out and I'm going to start breathing for them. Now, thinking back to lung tissue, what on on maybe let's think of the alveoli, the little air sacs. All right. So if I've got fluid in there and I'm now pressing it out, what does the alveoli do? No, I, I, I'm doing this. I'm sorry. I'm probably confusing you by doing this. I'm a sack. These are my sacs. <laughs> We're going to expand it. And then what else is happening? Now I've got air pressure along with the water that's sitting in there. What's it gonna do? It's gonna compress it down and it's hopefully going to press it out of the alveoli when you're doing that, all right? Because the alveoli is thin enough, remember guys, that when blood passes through, right? It's allowing the oxygen to come in and attach and go through. So deoxygenated blood then picks up the oxygen. 
So hopefully we're able to squeeze that out and get some of the fluid out in that manner. Okay, think of it that way. Our alveoli are thin enough to be able to diffuse that water out. Okay, so we're doing our positive pressure ventilation. What else do I want to consider? We already said suction. What if, what if I'm not getting that great of control on an airway? Adjust. Adjust? You can adjust. An OPA. An OPA or an NPA? Yeah, keep their tongue up. Keep it from the back of their throat. Yeah, because I don't want it flopping around and getting in my way. So you could do that. Think about the things that you have at your disposal that you guys can do. Again, you guys may not be able to do much, but work with what you got. All right, if you can use it, please use it. So use your skills. So if you could put an OPA in, great, put an OPA in. So now that we've got an OPA in, we're doing our BVM. Um, do we want to put them on oxygen with that BVM? Yeah, right, because they just went without oxygen for who knows how long. Now I want to get some more oxygen back into their bloodstream. Do some vitals, right? Hopefully get some stuff on them. Call for help. Yes. You're going to be my call for help class. <laughs> just I'm, I'm just going to ask you something. Call for help. So all right, so we've called for help. What else do you guys have at your disposal? Right, I, I can place an endotracheal tube in somebody, what can you do? Superglottic? Your king? Stuff like that. If they're truly unconscious and that you need control of the airway and you need to do stuff like that, throw in an advanced airway. Okay. Get better control. You'll get better seal, and then you won't have to worry about getting any air into the stomach, right? Because that's a concern, too, that we have when we're doing ventilations and airway control that's not an advanced airway. Hopefully, you get it right and you don't inflate the stomach, and then you'll end up with a bunch of stomach contents on you. Okay. So we've got that going. What else do we want to do? We called for help. Rapid transport, thank you. There we go. Okay, so um, what else do you think that we need to consider with drowning emergencies? Outside. Temperature outside, right? Temperature of the water too, right? Because it can make us hypothermic, definitely. Um, depending on how long that person was in the water. How long was that person down for? How long were they in the water? because that can determine how survivable they are. I've recovered bodies from the lake that happened a week ago that we know, because one of them drowned. We were able to get one out, but then the other one got taken away by the current, and he just ended up as a body recovery later. It was actually my dog that found him, because my dog is a search and rescue dog that also does cadaver work and can do scenting from water. And recovering bodies from water is not fun. The things that happen when bodies have been submerged for a long time, skin will slough off. You will see that. It's not fun. The body expands. It's just, it's not, it's not a fun thing to encounter. So what about kids when they drowned? It's easier for them to drown, right? They're small, they're little, right? Maybe I am a stressed out mother. I just had a brand new baby and I had just uh, turned to deal with something real quick while my baby was in the bathtub and I thought he was in that nice little play thing or not play thing, um, the bathtub like cradle thing that they get for them. And he slipped out and I was gone for like a minute. Babies don't know how to control themselves and get themselves up 
like an adult does, so they can drown a whole lot more easier. Now, what is the biggest concern with pediatric patients? And it's going to be the same way in cardiac arrest with your medical pediatric patients. It's going to be airway. Okay, gain control of the airway. Airway is the number one cause of cardiac arrest in children. Okay, airway compromise. That's why those respiratory bugs are so awful to them. That's why it's so detrimental that they get medical care when they have these respiratory problems. And that's why even the flu will kill a kid. So, I have a kid that drowned. We're kind of going to do the same thing, right? As we would with an adult. Yeah. Even those toddlers, like you've seen it all the time, that those toddlers, right, they just do, 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 and then boom, into the pool. And then the parents were like, hey, where's the kid? And then they don't know how long the kid was in the water for. Same thing, they have the respiratory collapse and then they have cardiac arrest. You're gonna do the same thing. Now, if somebody partially drowned, okay, what do, what do you think that I mean by partially drowned? They had the kids have water in the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're able to get them to them in time before they experienced a cardiac episode. And now what do you think you have to deal with now that they have a bunch of water in their lungs? No, no you're not going to do CPR on them. Yeah, you can suction them, but how do we suction our patients? On their back. Okay. Um, have you been explained that you only go as far as you can see and for no longer than 10 seconds will you suction, right? But if it's all sitting in my lungs, are you just going to keep on, on, and on, and on? Provide them oxygen. Sit them up. They're probably going to look like those really bad asthmatic patients that are almost tripoding themselves because they're trying to open up their own airways. Guess what? We have much a whole lot more alveolar space in the back of our lungs than we do the front. So I start doing this. This is what you've heard about these COVID patients as well. They're pronating them. So I'm laying on my stomach while I'm breathing and that's because I have more real estate back here. So that's what I'm doing. So right, so we've taught us, we're going to provide supplemental oxygen to our patients that have water in our lungs. Now, not even in water, but let's think about the elderly. So in the elderly, right, our muscles start deteriorating, things start malfunctioning, everything's falling apart. Shit, I'm not even 30 yet and I'm still falling apart. So who knows when I get to 60, if I even make it to 60 long. Well, <laughs> so, but you've heard a lot of like these patients, like, so they've lost their teeth. They may be on a soft diet, but some people are on a softer diet because they have issues swallowing. Like what we talked about with those stroke patients, right? So if I'm elderly and I have difficulty swallowing and I just swallowed a bunch of water, but it went the wrong way and into my lungs, can I technically drown myself without being submerged in water? Yes. Absolutely. Would your treatment still be the same? Yes. Provide supplemental oxygen. Now for you, we'll be going over skills of things that you can do higher pressure oxygen systems that are not just BVMs. And you'll see it more on the trucks and we'll probably be demonstrating it here in class soon when we go over skills. Um, so we'll be practicing with that. And of course, when we do the skills, I'll go over it with you guys to say, this is what it is. This is what I was talking about. You remember, and we'll connect the dots. Okay, 
but otherwise for drowning emergencies, you'll do that. And then of course, with considerations, if you're doing cardiac arrest care, now you're having to do CPR on somebody that just drowned. What are you doing? When you take them out of the water and then you need to place the pads. Yeah, you wanna dry them off as much as possible, at least the chest area, right? Because this is where the electricity is traveling. Most of the AEDs and most of the monitors nowadays are called biphasic. So meaning that the electricity is coming from both electrodes and meeting towards the heart. So hopefully we're keeping the electricity more centralized in here. Doesn't mean that you still won't get shocked if you end up touching that patient when they press that shock button. Because guess what? If that happens to you, I promise you, you're going to get called Sparky for a month. If you're not seriously hurt, of course. And then once you recover, then we'll call you Sparky for a month. Okay. So you want to be careful of those considerations. Okay. And then back to those cold emergencies. If a patient is in snow, do you have to remove them from the snow if you're going to place the AED? No. Actually, snow, so it's going to sound weird, frozen water does not conduct electricity the same way that it does in its liquid form. So you don't have to remove somebody from snow in order to deliver a shock. Okay. Just as long as they're not in a puddle, like it's melting or anything like that. If it's nice, fresh powdered snow and it's still cold, cool. Go ahead. All right. So do you guys have any questions on that? Anything at all? Okay, so let me, guys, let me ask you guys this. What is it that you need from me to help you learn? I think I kind of like the way you're explaining today. It's kind of like, you don't exactly dumb it down, but when you add something else into it, like a word, you explain that word also. Like kind of like reassuring us that, oh, that's what this is, but that's what we agree to this. Okay. I like that. That's Okay, yeah, and definitely if if you guys please if you have any questions, I'm going on a tangent and right I'm in the middle of something go, hey, what about this like I just this question, you know, because I'm just talking about that topic and it popped into your head, please by any means. Go, hey, real quick, what about this? And we can talk about it. I'm not going to make you wait. I don't have that much of a memory problem. I have some memory problems, but I promise we'll get we'll get back on topic for you guys. So explaining it a little bit better. So we'll go over some more scenarios, giving you maybe some real life. Well, I'm not going to just all of a sudden like go whack somebody and then give you a patient. But I'll give you an example of patients that I've had and we'll go over treatment options or I'll make one up for you guys. OK, to help you learn and skills we will do hands on stuff. Start getting going, learning. Maybe get you guys thinking a little bit faster because guess what? In EMS, everything's fast, but also remember it's not your emergency. So you don't have to panic. That's what I do. I'm like, well, that sucks. Let's go ahead and do this. <laughs> you know, it's not me. It's not my personal emergency, okay? If you guys need a second to think, go ahead by any means. If you need help from me, please come to me and ask. There's no dumb questions. I've only truly had one dumb question. Well, and it wasn't a dumb question. It was a dumb statement. And it was a student that told me that we don't do CPR on dead people. And I was like, then who do we do CPR on? Like, come on, guys. <laughs> you know, so yeah, let's do this. So we're we're going to do this. And then, of course, I'm going to review with you guys some of the stuff that you've gone over in the past with your material. That way I, I know for sure that you guys are where you need to be. OK, and if there's any stuff from um, past material, please feel free. Um, you're here tomorrow, right? 
So probably tomorrow afternoon, I'll supply you guys with my email. That way you guys can email me. Lou's going to be adding me soon to the instructing stuff and setting me up on your EMS testing and going from there. Um, but yeah, if because I know everybody learns differently. Some people are hands on. Some people need further explanation into a thing in order to grasp the concept. Some people need it dumbed down. Either way that you need it, trust me, I, I've learned in very many different ways and I've teach and I've taught in very many different ways. So I don't mind switching it up a little bit. That way it benefits you guys in the end because I mean, you're paying for this, right? You want the best education possible. The only thing that I need from you is that you guys come prepared and that you try. Okay, just know that you're gonna try. And I won't let you guys just sit back and do nothing. Okay, I expect you guys to come and do things. Okay, so is there anything else? Anything from you guys on online land? No, ma'am. No, we're good. Okay, well, I... I'm still here. Sorry, my thing wouldn't unmute. <laughs> Is, um, if you guys have any problems, of course, I'm going to be here tomorrow and Friday. I might be in and out a little bit because I have a couple appointments, but otherwise, Lou will also be helping as well. Um, but otherwise, I believe next week I am going to be officially taking you guys over. So otherwise, you guys know what you're supposed to study for next or not next week for tomorrow. Have prepared, come to class. Maybe I'll have something set up for you guys. OK. All right, you guys are free. Clean off your paper, you guys, an online lens. Thank you. You have a good day. Thank you so much. You too. Bye, guys. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me.